Let's start. Okay. Uh, good evening. My name is Kit Sheehan. Uh, we're. Turn your hand. Well, uh, the, the, the problem is, is that's a technical issue that we're having problems with. So if I if I don't connect to the the audio over there, then I don't need the headset. It's not going to come out the speaker. It's yeah. going through the computer. Oh, no. But we need. Oh, I, can't, I can't help it right now. Actually, I, I, I think we can get it through the speaker uh, with just that on. Let me try. Well, you're live, by the way. Yeah, that's fine. Coming back up here. Just test. We're having some difficulties here. Some technical difficulties. Are you on? Uh, yes. Uh, Testing one. There we go. Yeah. So I do. I can. Uh, I, I've got speaker, but I just don't have uh, one of my recording audio. So we're using the backup audio. So. Okay. But we're live on Facebook. So uh, uh, let me double check here. Yep. There we are. So okay. Um, uh, last couple of three weeks or so, I've, I've talked a little bit about Israel. I seem to be stuck on that. Uh, was Good place to get stuck. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. I talked about uh, the missiles about three weeks ago uh, and related that to Zephaniah, of course, and uh, um, uh, the possibility of, of how Israel might lose Ashkelon and Ashdod. <laughs> And last week I talked about the election and uh, talked a little bit about uh, the Palestinians and they call themselves the Philistine. Uh, so uh, it's an interesting. Um, and I talked, I mentioned uh, as I was teaching one one week about uh, uh, Abraham as, as like was uh, the rabbis in their writings had uh, made a story that was really kind of a story based on Gideon. At least that was the, the writer's <coughs> concern. So uh, I, I decided, well, wh what are these writings? The, the Talmud and the Mishnah. So I got a book on... on, on uh, and, but I thought I'd give you some background because I was surprised, and I, I mean it was something I should have thought of right away, is, is any book uh, or writing, I mean we have here the hermeneutics, it's, you have to interpret it in the time in which it was written, the, the culture, the, and so on. Well, the, the, the Talmud and the Midrash, uh, they're written after 70 AD, so, so there's some history there that, uh, that I thought I'd go over just a little bit because uh, there's a guy, and I wanted to read a little bit about him, uh, Simon Bar Kosiva. Uh, he, I think he's also Simon Bar Kokhba. I don't know how to, how, I'm just not sure the pronunciation. We wouldn't be able to correct you. Uh, well, <laughs> so, so. Maybe Herman. Yeah, well, uh, but uh, whatever. But uh, so the, the, there's some interesting things. I was going to read a couple paragraphs out of here and then something out of out of the Wikipedia. Just some background, some history on Israel. And and so what the, that history after 70 AD, I mean 70 AD itself, but after also uh, forms um, the Jewish, uh, the, their own concept of who they are. I mean, they didn't have a temple. So who are we if we don't have a temple? So, so they have to reinterpret or they have to add some, some writings to say, well, what do we do now? Well, let me, I'm just gonna read uh, some, some stuff I got from this book. I, I only got through the first, first chapter and I've got uh, yellow, yellow highlights. I, um, the books that I studied, since they're my books, I, I put yellow stuff in there. So, so when I go back, I can find, uh, where was that quote? Where was that quote? So I, I got yellow highlights. I just look at the, oh, there it is. You so, don't read from Simeon first. Pardon? You're not reading from him first. Uh, right. I'm right. just reading from this book. Okay. Uh, and then I'll, I'll, I'll uh, talk about Simon uh, in a little bit because he was a uh, center, center on, on that. But I was surprised on some of the stuff I wrote, I, I read. Uh, the rabbinic literature. Yeah, yeah, yeah I got, I've got to have my other pair of glasses in order to read this. Otherwise, I'll be putting it out here. But that's. I can hold it. 
appreciate that the offer, but the rabbinic literature here discussed dates from the first millennium of our era. In other words, it's it's after Christ. The period in question ranges approximately from the destruction of Jerusalem and its temple by Titus in the year 70 to the decline of the Geonic Academies of Babylonia around 1040, although the latest works of rabbinic literature were compiled centuries after this date. Uh, following that was, the following is a brief recapitulation of the basic facts about this period, since no literature can under, be understood without its historical context. Uh, the two most important centers of Jewish life at the time were Palestine and Babylonia. Rabbinic literature developed almost exclusively in these centers. And, you, and, and indeed, you have the, the Palestinian and the, and the Babylonian uh, uh, documents. Uh, from these early beginnings, there slowly developed a new leadership of Palestine, able to guide Judaism through a period without temple and state. They had no temple and there's no Israel. So what, how, do we, how do we live? We're Jews. We, 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 that's what we're supposed to have. Um, from the modern perspective, I'm skipping over a couple of stuff, just going to my yellow stuff so that I, I, I read. Otherwise, some of this would be uh, boring or uh, pedantic. From the modern perspective, the year 70 is a decisive turning point in Jewish history. But did contemporaries also regard it as such a clear watershed separating the, temp the period of the temple and the Pharisees from the period after 70 AD without the temple and the rabbis? Um, I, uh, skipping down, kind of breaking into a sentence, when it was clear that there would be no temple and no restoration of earlier conditions in the foreseeable future, the real break in the history of the Pharisaic rabbinic movement comes not at 70 with the destruction of the temple, but at 140 with the devastation of southern Palestine and the reconstitution of the rabbinic movement and only and the patriarchal government in the north. Only now there was an awareness that the break of 70 AD was irreparable or irreparable. Um, so, so the point was that they had already lost the temple once. Oh, we'll get it back. I mean, we've, we've uh, Herman was talking about the Ezekiel uh, some time ago, and and the the Jews were saying. Uh, um, uh, just in two years, we'll be back in Jerusalem, uh, and we'll have the temple. And so there was this hope that okay, and eventually they did get back, but not in two years. It was seventy. So, so, uh, um, so that's what they're thinking. Apparently, was okay. We, we've still got uh, people in in uh, in Israel, um, so uh, we'll, we'll get the temple back. But uh, somewhere around uh, one thirty-five uh, A.D., there was this revolt. And the Romans put down that revolt so so strenuously that they realized we're not getting the temple back. Mm. And so then the question is, well, what do we do now? So uh, that's the part of the Simon Bar Kokhba comes in. I'm just going to read a little bit. I, I could uh, read hours, I suppose, of, of some of the stuff that, that happens. Um, but I've, I've just picked a... Uh, one thing here from, from Wikipedia, which seemed to be easy to get to, and there's a couple of sentences in here that are, were, were helpful. So Simon ben Koseva, or Koseva, known to posterity as Bar Kokhba, was a Jewish military leader who led the Bar Kokhba revolt uh, against the Roman Empire in 132 CE. CE just means AD. Uh, it's just a... Uh, uh, the Common era. Yeah, common era. Yeah, they don't like to put uh, Anno Domina, our Lord. The revolt, is, <clears throat> the revolt established a three-year-long independent Jewish sta state in which Bar Kokhba ruled as Nazi prince. Some of the rabbinic scholars in this time imagined him to be the long-expected Messiah. Uh, Bar Kokhba fell in the fortified town of Bitar. Um, so down in the background here. Despite the devastation wrought by the Romans during the first Jewish-Roman War, 66 to 73 CE, which left the population and countryside in ruins, a series of laws established by Roman emperors provided the incentive for the Second Rebellion. Based on the delineation of years in Eusebius Chronicle, uh, the Jewish revolt began under the Roman governor, Tinius uh, Rufus, in the 16th year of Hadrian's reign or what was equivalent to the fourth year of the 20, 227th Olympiad. It'd be nice if they actually put some, some dates in there so we could, for our kind of dates, but they didn't. 
Hadrian sent an army to crush the resistance, but it faced strong, a strong opponent since Bar Kokhba, as the recognized leader of Israel, punished any Jew who refused to join his ranks. Two and a half years later, after the war had ended, the Roman Emperor Hadrian barred Jews from ending, entering Aelia Capitolina, the pagan city he built on the ruins of Jew, Jewish Jerusalem. So he built another city on top of, and it was was a pagan city. Not, Hadrian not, did? Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yes. Uh, the name Aelia was derived from one of the emperor's names, Aelius. According to uh, Philostorius, this was done so that its former Jewish inhabitants might not find in the name of the city a pretext for claiming it as their country. So he started to rename things. And there's, uh, where, 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 oh. Um, the second Jewish rebellion took place 60 years after the first and established an independent state lasting three years. Uh, for many Jews at the time, this term of events was heralded as the long hoped for messianic age. The, 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 the millennium is here. Not. Uh, the Romans fared very poorly during the initial revolt facing a unified Jewish force. In contrast to the first Jewish Roman war, there where Flavius Josephus records three separate Jewish armies fighting each other for control of the Temple Mount during three weeks after the Romans had breached Jerusalem's walls and were fighting their way to the center. Being outnumbered and, heavily, and taking heavily casualties, the Romans adopted a scorched earth policy which reduced and demoralized the Judean populace, slowly grinding away at the will of the Jews to sustain the war. Um, uh, well, let me just kind of skip to where... Um, yes, yeah, here. So costly, this is in the outcome and aftermath. So costly was the Roman victory that the, Hadrian, the Emperor Hadrian, when reporting to the Roman Senate, did not see fit to begin with the customary greeting, if you and your children are healthy as well, and I and the legions are healthy, because the legions were not healthy. In the aftermath of the war, Hadrian consolidated the older political units of Judea, Galilee, and Samaria into the new province of Syria, Palestinia, which is commonly interpreted as an attempt to complete the disassociation with Judea. So, in, in one respect, that's, that's where we get Palestine, uh, because the, the, the Roman emperor wanted to get rid of Israel because they kept, these people kept coming back to Israel, calling it their homeland, and building a temple, and they were always a problem. So we're going to get rid of them. So, anyhow, that's, that was from his perspective, not mine. Anyhow, that was, uh, uh, for me, it was interesting uh, that the Jewish... Uh, understanding of, of that things are completely different didn't happen until about 140 uh, AD so that was something that I didn't understand and that's the basis for the this Midrash and the, and the Talmud that answering the questions well what do we do now when there's no temple we can't do sacrifices in the temple we can't we can't go uh, uh, to the temple at the at the at the feasts there is no temple um, so uh, from, out from that understanding came the Talmud and the Mishnah and, and, and looking at at the uh, um, at the Bible uh, uh, to interpret it for their uh, application to their time. Um, so they just ignored what God gave them. Well, and, no, he didn't. He didn't. He and, didn't he, he just, did. and made their own thing up. Well, uh, they had to to. Um, and I haven't. I, I only got the first chapter here, so I don't know that much. <laughs> but but uh, uh, they had to interpret things, and uh, they added stories, like they say, the one on Abraham. To and there was an oral tradition, um, just like, uh, for instance, the Catholic Church. You've got the Bible, and 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 you've got the oral tradition, written and oral. And the Catholic Church took the, the, the oral tradition and it, it, in many cases, doesn't, it's based, supposedly based on the Bible, but you look at the, at the tradition and, and the, what, what they say the tradition is and what the Bible is, and it doesn't, doesn't match with what, with what we read. And, and that may be the same thing with uh, the, the Talmud and the Mishnah. They, they take the Bible uh, and they, they, they look at the words um, and in some cases, they did change the Bible. 
there's one, one place where they put an extra letter in there because there was a son of, of Moses and they said, no son of Moses is going to do that. So this must have been Manasseh. Um, so they, they, there's some reinterpretation. Uh, now, did I understand in your reading that in about 145, 140, 140, they even changed out of Jerusalem the name, that name? Yes. They did not even use they, they, it. They used it, Elia Capitolina. So they did not. The, the Romans Jerusalem. called it that. Why not Jerusalem? Well, I, well, let me go back and read what it because says. They didn't want. They, they wanted to erase the Jews. What? Erase the Jews. So according to this uh, well, Greek philosophy, Jews the Romans that did that. No. No, no, no. It was the, it was Romans. the Romans. Romans. What did the Jews do? They. Uh, they were dead, or they, or they moved out of there. Uh, they wrote a new book. So you're not reading about what they did. No, that no. I'm reading about the background of, of before okay. they wrote. Okay. And and I was I, I'm going to read the read this and get some idea. But I was surprised just about what 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 the the context of what they were, what they were writing in, uh, and and the big things of course is no temple, no state. Yeah. Uh, but as long as there were still people in in Jerusalem and they still called it Jerusalem, um, I guess the Romans still called it Jerusalem at the, up, up until they renamed it. Yeah. Um, and after 70 AD, the, apparently they built another pagan city and renamed it. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and slowly, and up, when, at, when it got to 140, they, they realized we're not going to get our temple back. And Jerusalem isn't Jerusalem anymore. It's a, Roman, it's a pagan city run by the Romans. And they, they even renamed Judea, so it's not even Judea anymore. It's Syria, Palestinia. Yeah, okay. And, and I, I'm just looking at the context of what, what the, the Jews ended up, uh, uh, and, and the, 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 in the end is, well, what do we do now? And, and I think that the, the answer is, well, well we got to write about it. Uh, and, and as soon as I, I finish writing here, I'll tell you what, what so we're going to do. So each Wednesday, we're going to get a little bit more. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, gotta, I don't know what's like next Wednesday, but i got to read more on this before I can uh, talk much. And, if it took me a whole week to read one chapter, I'm not sure how fast I'm going to get through. Because I was, like I say, I was really surprised. Or, or And maybe I had heard some of these things, but when I brought it all together, um, then then uh, um, it, it made it made sense, but it gave me a new perspective. Um, and I didn't know exactly when the Talmud and the Mishnah were written. And well, that was after 70 AD. And it was in this context of no temple, no state. Yeah. What do we do now? Our, 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 our scripture says we have a temple or a tabernacle and we have a state. Well, we don't now. So what do we do? Um, so I've gone way over. Um, <laughs> but it, I'm glad there's, there, there are questions, and this does relate to the Bible, um, because it, it, it has to do with what did the Jews think about after 70 AD? And we, since we refer to the Talmud and the Mishnah sometimes to interpret Bible passages, um, what 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 context was were those written in? And like I say, it was was it two weeks ago uh, where I talked about uh, there was a Mishnah thing about Abraham as uh, uh, destroying his father's idols, and uh, um, uh, so that was not in the Bible. But the but the rabbi the rabbi that wrote that said that this is in the Mishnah, and and it looked like they just took took Gideon. As as a prototype, after the fact, I guess <laughs> he, he wasn't before Abraham; he was after. But they used that as a as a template on which to build the story of Abraham. But that was an indication of how important they felt that Gideon was. Here, Gideon had done all these things, and well, he can't he can't outdo Abraham. Abraham's got to do some of these things too. So, oh. <laughs> so uh, we have to to. to Pump him up, maybe I don't know. But the, the, as I said, in the, when I was teaching that, is that is that they had nothing on the on the childhood of Abraham. And here you've got uh, uh, a couple of things on some of the judges, especially when we get to Samson. I got a, 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 a whole background on on uh, his birth. Well, anyhow, let me get to prayer here. Uh, unless there's some other questions, I, I'm, I'm happy to answer questions of what I know. You know, all I know is the first chapter so far. So when I get to the second or third chapter, I might have some more to give to you. <laughs> but I found it interesting. Okay, so... Uh, um, One thing I think is interesting is that in that era, 70 AD on, yeah. that 
they were still very strong on understanding the law, the yeah. Mosaic law, and they sure. demanded that you still live by it. And there was no Jerusalem. Yeah. But they were under that wherever they were. Yeah, yeah. So Okay, I, I don't know. Uh, do we have any special requests for prayers today? Um, yes. Need a job. Oh, I need a job. Okay. That's it. Uh, okay, so. Stand up. What? Need that. A job. That's it. That's it. Um, uh, I guess we've. Uh, uh, and wife. Oh, oh. Okay. You might need two jobs. <laughs> okay. Um, so, uh, 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 so I guess we're we're through uh, the the youth uh, camp that's coming up real soon. <coughs> yes, sir. Uh, week of the twenty seventh, twenty uh, uh, and oh, last wow. yeah, and uh, uh, we're all gearing up for it. And, and write Bible classes and get people on site. We've had a few uh, uh, more campers that, that, that joined in. Okay. So it's, it's looking great. I, you know, it's, uh, we have as many, you know, we could have had a one-to-one -one camper to uh, 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 college student ratio, but we couldn't afford to do it that way. But uh, uh, it's, it's, it's just great encouragement that so many college students want to come back and be a part of it. And, uh, you get to hear the word of God and uh, lead others in the study of the word of God. So that's also part of it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we pray for uh, Herman and Judith, uh, as well as John Hintz and Jody and Kim Brown, Fossil. I guess he's going to be here on the 27th. And... Uh, we're working on that. Yeah. Working on that? Yeah. All right. All right. And so we've got, uh, of course, uh, uh, um, uh, everybody that, that, that teaches. Uh, Phil and Chris, myself, uh, of course I mentioned uh, Herman, uh, we all need uh, a little prayer there to prepare. Um, um, I guess uh, we've got uh, healing and uh, Tish and uh, Brian and uh, other people uh, uh, doing, doing fairly well now. Tish is doing very well. Good, good, Tish is doing good, all right. Well, let's go into prayer. Um, I, I suspect I'm going to go over, but that's all right. I, I, I think the last couple of days or weeks, uh, it was, I was maybe a little early, but. Uh, so we all get excited. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Father, for today. Thank you for so many blessings. Uh, Thank you for the, the the time, the ability, the freedom to assemble and, and worship by studying your word. Thank you for uh, so many people that have made it possible to have a, a written scripture in our own language. We're, we're very grateful, Father, and we're grateful for the country we have. We do ask that you help us uh, help the country uh, stay out of trouble. Uh, we seem to be getting into trouble, and uh, we need, uh, I don't know, another Billy Graham or somebody to give the gospel to so many people that are hostile against the, the Word of God. Help our leaders. Uh, many of them do not believe in, in Jesus Christ as Savior, and they need the gospel, Father. Uh, so we pray for them and help them, guide them, um, that they may make good decisions for America, and, and that Your will be be evident. Thank you, Father, for the opportunity to to teach. And I ask that uh, you, you give me words to to say what you want. To, Give me words that communicate, uh, that, can, that are understanding, that people might grow and be able to apply the Bible to their own lives. We thank you, Father, again. We ask us in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Um, we're we're going to end up on a on a journey uh, today. I guess I can read this. Uh, um, uh, so, uh, but we're going to start uh, at, at Judges six thirty three. Um, every every almost every week I hear uh, whether it's Phil or Chris or or Herman and, and myself as well that we talk about the believer's relationship to God. Uh, we, I remember in in college that uh, that uh, 
Christianity is, is our relationship with God, with Jesus Christ, the, through the power of the Holy Spirit. We go to the Father in, in prayer. Um, and uh, in Judges, we see a face-to-face -face relationship between, at times, between the second person of the Trinity, the preexistent Christ, and, and individual people. Uh, now, believers in the church age, we are in Christ, and we have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and potentially the filling of the Spirit if we uh, are walking by faith. But what was the relationship of the third person of the Trinity and the believer in the time of Judges? Um, I'm going to delve into that a little bit. That, that's quite a large topic, but I can. Uh, I had some a question uh, was, what's the relationship? How do they how do they get the the Holy Spirit? Mechanics of it, more or less. And we'll go through a bunch of passages, and that's mostly what we're going to be talking about today. But we'll start in Judges 6.33. Then all the Midianites, the Amalekites, and the people of the east assembled together, and they crossed over and camped in the valley of Jezreel. So as I mentioned last week, at some point the hostile forces were aware of what was going on in Israel. There was organized opposition growing inside Israel, like other texts in the book of Judges. There's no narrative explaining how this happened. That's not important to this story. And I've, I've more and more said there are things that are not in the Bible that we wish there were. But I think John in his gospel answered that. Well, if we put everything that we that we wanted to know, there wouldn't be enough books in the whole universe. to. <laughs> so, so we have to make do with what's there. But, and what's there is, is focused on God's message to us. Um, so I remember somebody said that the, the Old Testament was written to the Jews. But it's for us, um, in, in the sense that uh, it was for them too. But uh, it's also for us, and the New Testament is all based on and and, uh, and, and and on the Old Testament, and the New Testament quotes it as a, an authoritative source. So the Valley of Jezreel, as another name uh, of this valley, is the Valley of Armageddon. And once you say that, oh, Revelation, I know where that is. And uh, um, so we're looking forward uh, with that name to a great battle that occurred at the end of the tribulation. And I wanted to read, uh, did I, let's see, do I already have this? Uh, here we go, from the Jerusalem Post. It's a, it's a little lengthy, but uh, I wanted to read this. Uh, it has to deal with uh, this, this valley because we've already encountered this valley once before with, uh, 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 was that Barak? Uh, with uh, the Canaanites when he was in the Valley of Jezreel. Now we heard about the, the river Kishon, which runs in that valley, um, but it's an important because there's, well, just let me just read it now and explain. And this is Jerusalem Post. I, I happened on, I said, well, that, that's a good place to read it from. It's not Wikipedia, it's from the, from the Jerusalem Post itself. All right, Armageddon. The word itself is awesome, ominous. The apocalypse erupts. The forces of good and evil collide, and unbelievers are doomed. A battleground where the international highway between Mesopotamia and Egypt widened enough to accommodate armies. The list of warriors who fought in the Valley of Megiddo reads like a who's who of warfare. Pharaohs, Tutmos, and Necho, Barak, Gideon, that's what we're here, Sennacherib, Josiah, Saul, Greeks, Romans, Crusaders, Sal Salahadim, Turks, Brits, and Israelis. So all those people, and then we still have the Battle of Armageddon yet to come in the, at the end of the Tribulation. It was a natural battlefield. Yes, it is. In contrast, the Jezreel Valley is comforting. Its, Hebrew, its name in Hebrew, God sows, promises full storehouses during the otherwise lean months. Understandably, the scripture prophesies of Issachar, to whom most of the valley was given. Issachar is a raw-boned donkey lying between two saddlebags. When he sees how good is his resting place and how pleasant is his land, he will bend his shoulder to the burden and submit to forced labor. Given the contrasting connotations, newcomers are invariably shocked to find that the Valley of Armageddon and the Jezreel Valley are the same place. Set in a wide valley, the junction of several ancient routes, the tribe of Issachar wasn't able to possess this coveted land and was relegated to the hills while the Canaanites occupied the fertile plain. Such was the situation in the 12th century BCE as Deborah, we're going back a little bit, but it's in our book Judges, 
a judge and prophetess, called back to war against the Canaanites who had effectively cut off the Galilee tribes. Having better weaponry and being adept at the use of chariots, Canaan's army had monopolized the valley. Cindy Parker, an expert on the physical settings of the Bible at Jerusalem University College, explains, the northern tribes are being dominated by the king of Hatzor. They're being oppressed, so they're, they've got to stay up in the hills off the main highways. The Israelites have got to be hurting economically and even politically, since they're being cut off from the more powerful house of Joseph, the tribes of Ephraim and Manasseh. Parker stresses that, according to Deborah's prophecy, the battle was to take place at the river Kishon, Judges chapter 4. She explains that the Jezreel is a flat valley surrounded by the Carmel and Gilboa mountain ranges, as well as Mount, uh, Mount Tabor, Mora, Mora, and the Nazareth Ridge, all of which force water into it. So the water of the Jezreel is drained only by the Kishon, with a flat valley and only one river draining it in rain season, the Jezreel can become very swampy. The winter muck of the Jezreel is aptly described by British archaeologist and adventurer Gertrude Bell, who crossed the valley in the rainy season in 1905. The mud was incredible. We traveled almost hours at a time, knee-deep in clinging mud. The mules fell down. The donkey almost disappeared. You could see nothing but his ears. <laughs> Camped at Harushit Hagoyim, and we, that was in that in Judges chapter 4. And we talked about that. Plantations of the Gentiles. Another reference to the land's fertility. The Canaanite forces prepared to engage the Israelite at the base of Mount Tabor. According to Judges 5, the Kishon flooded suddenly, likely due to an abrupt storm. Consequently, the chariots previously considered a strategic advantage became a hindrance. The mountain warriors descended from Mount Tabor, an elevation they used to their advantage, rushing the bogged down Canaanites and subduing them with the superior hand-to-hand -hand skills they had honed in the mountains. While the Israelites then had peace for 40 years, such lush property of, on a vital intersection was hard to secure. Judges 6, that's where we are now, describes the Midianites coming in as numerous as locusts to take the land's bounty and leave no sustenance for Israel. The Midianites, residing in present-day southern Israel, Jordan and western Saudi Arabia, would enter the Jezreel from the Beit She'an Pass and scour the land as far as Gaza. The Judge Gideon mustered his men at the foot of Mount Gilboa, a strategic place since Gilboa rises sharply from the valley, making it easily defended. It also gave Gideon a good view of the Midianites and their allies across the flatland at Mount Mora. Thirdly, Gilboa provided the only spring in the area not exposed to the enemy ranks. Tens of thousands of soldiers reported to Gideon, who first released the fear, fear, fearful. About 10,000 soldiers remained. Remember the Judges chapter 4, 10,000? We had 10,000 witnesses, and here we got 10,000 again. But God told Gideon, that's too many. Lest Israel claim glory against me, saying, my own hand has saved me. Again, it's God that saved me. Gideon was given instructions to further call his ranks. The army was brought to the Herod Spring at the bottom of Gilboa, so Gideon could observe how his soldiers drank. Those who drank from their hand numbered 300, while the vast majority who got on their knees to drink directly from the stream were dismissed. George Adam Smith, professor and pastor and professor and a 19th century historical geographer of the Holy Land, explains, those Israelites, therefore, who bowed themselves down on their knees drinking headlong could not appreciate their position or that of their foe, whereas those who merely couched or crouched scooping up water with one hand while holding their weapons in the other, keeping their face to the enemy the whole time, were ready against surprise. What Gideon had in view was a night march and the sudden surprise of a host, tactics that might be spoiled by a few careless men. The night march over the two miles to the Midian camp culminated when the Israelite army divided into three groups of 100, panicking the enemy by flashing torches, trumpeting and shouting, the sword for the Lord, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. But the sword was unnecessary, as the hysteria among the Easterners causing them to draw swords on each other. The military position... Sometimes when, when a, a page wants to refresh, he goes all the way back to the beginning. He doesn't care where I was. Um, Keep going. 
Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> there we go. The military positions were much the same a century later when King Saul camped at the spring of the Jezreel, likely the Herod Spring, and the Philistines held Mount Moriah. According to Parker, this was a continuation of Saul's lifelong campaign against the Philistines, who held the main roads and flatlands while he and his army occupied the mountains. Having Philistines in the Jezreel Valley means they're powerful, controlling. They occupy the Herod Valley, Jezreel, Megiddo. This proves their strength. Again, the northern tribes are cut off from the southern tribes. Saul needed to break this stronghold. This is why a battle took place. Parker speculates, Saul probably already knew that God's favor had gone from him to David. I think he knew he was in an impossible situation, and perhaps some of the resultant fear drove him to consult a witch. Um, I will... Uh, it goes on here and talks about uh, other kings, but the idea is there's a long history of battles in, in that, that area. So, uh, down here we're... One of the most interesting things that I discovered then there was looking at that land area of the uh, Armageddon area and the Gehoa was that it was not grown, not no big uh, uh, play, uh, uh, cities or nothing. It's just still for hundreds of years. Yeah. And that still is there again. ready to be for battle. Yeah. They yeah. don't plant on it or anything? Right? Yeah, grass. They don't plant? Well, yeah, there's plants. But as there's no as, cities. As far as any cities or anything uh, uh, that would they use for that interrupt with a, with a war, yeah. not there. Yeah, yeah. Very yeah. wild. So it's very, very fertile. So they use that to, to, to make the, the desert bloom. Yeah. Uh, so uh, uh, let's see here. There we are. That's where I am. I got the red mark. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, that's not going to work too well. Anyhow. Uh, so crossed over at the bottom of the page. Uh, the text doesn't say what they crossed over. Uh, but it could have been the Kishon River or some other <coughs> geographic uh, place, but the, the crossing may also have been symbolic. Once they crossed over, their fate was sealed. Um, so, Judges 6.34. We'll probably spend the rest of the tonight uh, there and maybe some of the next week. So the Spirit of the Lord covered Gideon like clothing, and he blew a trumpet, and the Abiezrites were called together to follow him. So the Spirit of the Lord, the Holy Spirit, so the Spirit of the Lord covered Gideon like clothing. I found that interesting. When I, and, and the, um, the it's verb uh, uh, means to clothe. It's not, it doesn't say to cover him with clothing. It's, it, uh, it's the verb to clothe. So it, I think one translator, the, little, uh, the Young's Little Translation says, the Holy Spirit clothed him because it's a verb. Uh, and that got me started. So here's Kit going on an, on an excursion here. But I, it was a question that I had, because I remember um, Theme and others, they talk about the endowment of the Holy Spirit. And so I look up, uh, what's endowment mean? I've never heard that word before. So it means provided. Well, how was it provided? Well, it, it was provided. Okay, well, so we'll, we'll look at some passages tonight um, that, that give us some clue uh, on that. And, and uh, at the end, if we get there, uh, I'm not sure I will. But the the the, the point is that there's no indwelling um, uh, in the Old Testament. Uh, there is the there's covered with clothing, or it, uh, it, it, it became a pond. Um, but there's no indwelling, and of course, there's places where you lose the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. We don't lose it. And I have one passage that kind of gives you a comparison, and that's one from the Millennium where it talks about the Holy Spirit inside. Oh, well that's that very different wording than what's in, in the Old Testament. And so in the, in the millennium, there will be an indwelling inside. And, and I think with each, each uh, dispensation, things get better and better. And if, if, if we knew all the good stuff that was gonna happen in the millennium, we might be jealous. But luckily God didn't tell us all the good stuff. I don't think you're gonna be there. Uh, we, we will be there. Uh, I understand that the, if my understanding is correct, the, the new covenant is not with the Christians, it was with the Jews, but, at, but we will be participating as administrators of the new covenant. 
Um, so we will be there, uh, part of the new government, uh, new covenant, as as administrators, uh, and uh, and. Uh, I, remember listening to something that Robbie Dean said that uh, we're now in boot camp getting ready for the millennium <laughs> yeah, I kind of like that is that uh, we're, we're learning about the angelic conflict we're learning about grace we're learning about God um, and uh, I think that, uh, that you have some of the the Jews that survived the tribulation the tribulation will be it'll be worse than the Holocaust um, it'll be terrible and I think when that when that when that's all over and those those people go into the millennium, they will have tremendous amount of humility because they will understand uh, God's grace, His provision, um, His plan, um, and uh, they're they're just uh, tremendous. And as I understand it, uh, reading Zephaniah or some other place, that the Jews will be held in high esteem. Uh, often today, that uh, you have anti-Semitism all over. There will be no anti-Semitism in the millennium. The people, everybody will look up to the Jews because they are special people. Uh, I, I know some people don't want to hear that, but that's that's what that's what what it, they're 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 God's chosen people, and in the millennium, they're they're very special. Anyhow, let me move on here. Um, so uh, uh, down here in the in the middle of the page, we'll take an excursion here to look at the endowment. Uh, oh, and I, I talked about uh, the, uh, that I uh, it provided. Uh, I really wanted some kind of picture relating the Holy Spirit to the to the Old Testament believer. By looking at passages in the Old Testament, focusing on some Hebrew verbs and prepositions, we may be able to have a better understanding of how endowment is provided. I'll not look at the function of the Holy, Holy Spirit in the Old Testament, only the mechanics of the impartation. Uh, I, I, if you start talking about Holy Spirit in the Old Testament, uh, would be on here for hours and hours. Um, there, there's a lot of stuff to see, and, and but I wanted to answer. This is in a sense is answering a question I had, and I, I take my questions to God and say, "Okay, God, what what does this mean?" Open and it talks. If you if you lack wisdom, go to God and ask for. Okay, open up my mind here. Help me understand. Okay, read the Bible. He says. Okay, <laughs> here's a list of passages. Look them up, and okay, well we're going to look at them. Um, uh, and I've organized, I, I, rather than just throw a bunch of passages at you, I've tried to organize the, 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 these into three three groups. Uh, the first I, uses the, the verb be, or become, or no verb at all, plus the Hebrew preposition that can be translated in, at, or with. Um, the second group uses the preposition translated upon with the various verbs. The third group uses a, a verb meaning to clothe, the one we just talked about. I added a fourth category, which is the millennium outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the Jews. This gives a contrast between the Old Testament imparting of the Holy Spirit and the post-cross impartation. Uh, in other words, here, here, here's, uh, uh, you contrast it and see there's a difference in the wording, in the vocabulary. So uh, Roman numeral one, I just have four, four Roman numerals, uh, one, two, three, four. The preposition be, uh, that's the Hebrew, with or in. Uh, so the following passage used the preposition is often translated in. However, I want to stress that that's only one. It can be with. So just because it says in doesn't mean inside, uh, but it can be with. Um, and, and so we need to look at other passages to help clarify what, what does this look like. Uh, so... Uh, the first passage is uh, Genesis 41, 38. That's Pharaoh talking. Uh, then, and so some of these speakers are not God. Uh, so, so some of these you have to, that's to what they said. So it may not be theologically correct, uh, but that's what, what they said. Then Pharaoh said to his servants, Can we find a man like this in whom there is a divine spirit? And some of these I'm not real happy with the translation, but that's the way it is. Pharaoh is looking for someone to interpret his dreams. He finds Joseph. The actual translation is if, in, or with. I use those. So they translate it in, but it could be translated with. Uh, whom the Spirit of God. There's no verb there. The, the is is uh, understood. It's likely that Pharaoh is familiar with demon possession. This is what Pharaoh said, and it's not necessarily an accurate description of the relationship of the Holy Spirit to Joseph. But... Uh, uh, they were probably uh, familiar, like I said, with demon possession, and so a spirit in them 
or a spirit controlling them uh, from the demonic side. Numbers 27, 18. Take Joshua, the son of Nun, a man in whom is the spirit, and lay your hand on him. Yahweh God, the Lord, is giving Moses instructions to appoint Joshua his successor. There's no verb is, it's understood. Literally, a man whom the spirit in him. But remember the in could be translated with. We know from the studies in the New Testament that during the church age, believers have an indwelling. There's no such thing in the Old Testament as we'll see. Daniel chapter 4, verse 8. But finally Daniel came in before me, uh, talking to Nebuchadnezzar, talking uh, here, uh, whose name is Belteshazzar, according to the name of my God, in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. Now the word gods there is Elohim. And I related the dream to him, saying, Belteshazzar, chief of the Sus soothsayer priests, since I know that a spirit of the holy gods is in you and no secret baffles you, tell me the visions of my dream which I have seen along with its interpretation. Again, this is Nebuchadnezzar relating his meeting with Daniel. And in verse 8, it's literally whom the spirit of the holy god in or with him. And the Elohim there uh, can be, is often used for God as like the Trinity, but it's also can be gods with a little g. Uh, depending upon the, the reference and, and so from from uh, Nebuchadnezzar's perspective it could have been God's uh, same thing in verse 9 now Roman numeral 2 the preposition upon and, and I'm not making any claim that I'm getting every single passage uh, 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 in the Old Testament on this but uh, I, I found a couple of lists and, and I, I put these in categories like I said so you have some idea at least of, of how the Holy Spirit is imparted in the Old Testament, the mechanics. Judges 3.10, And the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, that's Othniel, and he judged Israel. When he went to war, the Lord handed over to him Cushan Rishathaim, king of Mesopotamia, so that he prevailed over Cushan Rishathaim. Here the narrator, possibly Samuel, inspired by the Holy Spirit, describes the provision of the Holy Spirit to the judge deliverer literally and became before becoming upon him the, the spirit of Yahweh. The word translated upon can be translated upon, above, over, but not in. The word came in the English translates a Hebrew word that does not mean to go or to come, uh, but is, is more like to be or to become. That's why I translate it to become. Um, uh, and in here the uh, uh, the Holy Spirit became or was upon Othniel instantly. Um, I, I pick up words from, from stuff I'm watching on TV, and there was a, 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 a police guy, and he says, Snap! That happened just like that. So, <laughs> snap! He all of a sudden, uh, he got the Holy Spirit. Uh, so, judge, uh, Judges 11.29, that's something we'll get to. Now the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah, and he passed through Gilead and Manasseh, then he passed through Mizpah Gilead, and from Mizpah Gilead he went on to the sons of Ammon. Here's another judge deliverer that we will study after Gideon. He also received the Holy Spirit. It is sovereignly bestowed, or as the verb says, became. Okay, can I ask you a question? Yes. I have thought about this. In the New Testament, we think in the terms of faith to be empowered. Yes. Here, snap. Yeah. No faith, no anything, just it, God, the Holy yeah, Spirit. Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's true. And that's, it's uh, like I said, uh, I, 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 my points at the very end, I think I put God sovereignly bestows the Holy Spirit. Um, and I probably should have put in there, there's no, as you pointed out, there's, there's no, um, no faith involved, no faith, involved. and uh, in some of these cases he's going to do it he's going to do it and there's a case uh, uh, at some point in here where Samson snap he gets the Holy Spirit and he kills 30 men uh, I, I'm just going to go into the mechanics of the Holy Spirit there's a lot in that passage did he murder those people and, and under the power of the Holy I, I'm not going to address that because I don't yes. <laughs> I, I'll get uh, as, as they said before when they were crossing the Kishon Valley in the rainy season they were knee deep in mud I'll be knee deep I'll be uh, uh, neck deep in mud trying to get my way out of that one <laughs> so I'll stick with just the mechanics for now 
So uh, um, uh, Judges 16, 20, she said, the Philistines are upon you, Samson. And he woke from his sleep and said, I will go out as other times and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had departed from him. So in the Old Testament, they could lose the Holy Spirit. And he thought that he still had the Holy Spirit, the power given to him by the Holy Spirit, the physical power, but he didn't. So you can lose it. So there, that we're, we're already seeing different, there was, there's, we, we, we depend on faith. In the Old Testament, the, the, the giving of the Holy Spirit was a, a sovereign decision. And some people you say, why does God give that person the Holy Spirit? When we get to Jephthah or Samson, you say, these are reprobates. Well, these these guys, uh, why in the world are that? And and they're they're in the heroes of the in, in the Hebrews eleven. How was that possible? Because they had a little grain of faith at one point, um, and that that at a key point, uh, and that's the point uh, uh, that different people make is that uh, the people in in the Hebrews chapter eleven are just ordinary people like you and me, uh, and so we don't have to be somebody. Somebody like, uh, well, I mean, you say David. Well, he's, he's like us too. He sinned. Um, and and uh, um, all these people, they all, they all have frailties. Uh, but because of faith, uh, God blessed them in, in amazing ways. And they put the stories down so that we can read and understand it. And, did, and, yes. Did Samson still have his faith when he lost the spirit here? I don't know that he had faith at this point. Uh, so most of the most of most of the time, most of the time, uh, Samson doesn't have any faith. He's right. he, he's 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 a uh, uh, oh, man. Th that they uh, what was it when we in the Air Force? I think it's maybe in the Army too. Uh, they worked hard and they played hard, uh, and sometimes that playing hard meant full of sin. Uh, so Samson is a very sinful person. So God used him. Yes. Without yes. his, I mean, it could yes. have been a rock. Yes, only yes. As a person. Well, and and uh, there's apparently some amount of faith in some amount of his time, but for most of what we see, Samson wasn't using faith. But there was a time at the very end where he destroys the temple, where he goes to God, and he's and he's at that point there's faith, um, and. Uh, and the same when you could look at uh, at Barak when he's uh, 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 talking to Deborah. Uh, I'm not going to go unless you go. I'm, where, where, I'm right with you. I'm right with you. Uh, so, um, uh, and and certainly uh, Gideon, he keeps asking the God, uh, and we'll, we'll, we'll get there today. But uh, at some point, he says uh, uh, to God, "Now, I got to be sure that you really want me to go, uh, just like you told me already." Well, if you told me already, why do you? <laughs> but God, uh, okay, God says, okay, put out your fleece and I'll do the water thing with it. And and uh, uh, then if you're still afraid, once you get there, don't go down to the camp there and listen to what they say. Uh, so Gideon is, uh, uh, he's got a lot of human viewpoint, a lot of fear, because uh, he doesn't, he doesn't understand the character of God. And, and that's that's part of I think what Judges is about is that it, it it shows God's faithfulness, His omnipotence, His omniscience. All those things come out when when He's working behind the scenes. And there's one word here, um, I don't know if I'll get to it. That that, uh, that I quote from the Theological Dictionary of the Old Testament. Um, uh, I, I won't say it right if I say it now. So I'll wait till we get there. But there's a neat little phrase from, and, and, and you say, wow, that's in this theological dictionary of the Old Testament. These guys aren't really believers, most of them probably, but they're very knowledgeable about the Hebrew. So, uh, but sometimes little glimmerings of uh, how did how did he, how did they let that through? So let me let me keep on going here. Uh, but the point of this Judges, unless there's some more questions or anything, I don't want to stop anybody. Uh, but this Judges sixteen twenty shows that uh, uh, you can lose the whole the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. Uh, in this case, the Holy Spirit had departed from Samson. Not included here is the departure of the Holy Spirit from Saul in First Samuel sixteen fourteen. I, I put that in there as kind of uh, one for me, so I can always go back. Where was that passage that where Saul lost the Holy Spirit? Oh, there it is. Um, okay, oh, now you're saying 
in the Judges 16 and 20 that they're losing the Holy Spirit. Yes. And it's not by anything they did. Um, they, didn't, they didn't gain him. So uh, well, well, at that point he'd shaved his head or his head had been shaved. So um, uh, I guess we'll, uh, before I go, we go into that to a certain uh, a lot, uh, we'll kind of wait till we get there with Samson. Uh, I, I don't want to go and exegete uh, Samson. I haven't gone through in, in detail. Well, that one. There are other verses in, in the Old Testament. But, but the, the, right. what leads into that, the context yeah. is that it shaved his head, and that was the point that that, that was the, the Nazarite. Uh, vow, yes, and and so that was associated with his strength. So yeah. essentially, by removing his hair, he's removed his faith in a sense of that. Yes. Well, he's done that a while ago. Now here's symbolically, he's he's uh, broken that vow, and so now uh, he's out of faith. And, and so in a sense, he's he's. But let's, let's take someone else other than Sam, Samson, um, Saul, Saul. Yeah, because he turned against God. And, and and turned against God, turned against God, turned Relax. against God, and I, and I took it out. I was going to say that's almost reminds me of in the New Testament when we lose the filling of the Holy Spirit, especially those words uh, uh, quench uh, and grieve the Holy Spirit. So it, 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 I see something like that with with Samson and Saul, is that they had been uh, constantly. Uh, uh, turned their back on God uh, and were trying to work their 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 lives without Him. Uh, okay, you want to live your life without me? I'll take my Holy Spirit away from you. Isaiah sixty one one. Now we have here a couple of passages uh, <coughs> that deal with Jesus Christ. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because the Lord anointed me to bring good news to the humble. He has sent me to bind up the broken heart and to proclaim release to captives and freedom to prisoners. This is a, a pass. This is a passage spoken by Isaiah for the Messiah, according to Thomas Constable. And he also mentions uh, uh, here's a passage with all three members of the Trinity mentioned: the Holy Spirit is imparted to Jesus Christ in the future by God the Father, literally the, the spirit of Adonai, Lord, God upon me. Uh, the verb is, again, is implied. Many places here, they don't, they don't put the verb uh, to be in there. It's, it's implied. Now we, we get to the second uh, group here, rested upon uh, in Numbers 11.25. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke to him, and he took away some of the spirit who was upon him. And placed him upon the seventy elders. And when the Spirit rested upon them, they prophesied, yet they did not do it again. So the Spirit was upon Moses. Uh, and, and there's a lot in this verse that uh, I'm going to skirt around. Uh, 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 there's just so much here. Uh, but God placed, um, uh, uh, so in the middle of that verse, placed him upon, in other words, the Holy Spirit upon the seventy elders. And the word place is our Hebrew word, natan, to give, or it also means to place. Uh, but we've seen that word natan, I don't know if that's a favorite word with Samuel, uh, but we've seen that a lot in the, in the earlier chapters of, uh, of, of Judges. Now, using your word uh, upon, yes. you still haven't changed that he's done it by faith. No. Or by design or anything. No. Okay. No. And, and like, so for instance, right here, let's just, I don't know that there's, uh, um, uh, there's one passage where we get to Elisha, where Elisha asked for the Holy Spirit. Um, and, uh, um, yes. but, in, but in all the other passages, we're not talking about faith. It's, it's a sovereign decision. And, uh, um, it's, in some cases, it's maybe unexpected. Um, for instance, here where you got these elders, or seventy elders, and and God just gives it to seventy elders, and all of a sudden they're prophesying, and and uh, um, and they, I doubt that they they expected that, um, and it wasn't again, it wasn't by faith, so it wasn't that wasn't a requirement in the Old Testament. Um, as I said, the word placed is our Hebrew word, natan, to give or to place. How do you figure that the second member of the Godhead, 
that you're talking about in the Isaiah 61. Again, the Holy Spirit just makes a decision to be there. Um, as part of God's plan, uh, but uh, um, I, 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 I guess I'm I'm only quoting that that passage to show another usage of that of the yes, impartation. I I'm not sure that I'm ready to explain all of, uh, of Christ's uh, uh, the Holy Spirit, uh, the baptism, uh, when the the dove and and uh, from the womb, and uh, but but there is another passage here. Where it talks about, uh, um, well, that, well, that's not really there. Um, um, but as far as how Jesus Christ got it, uh, uh, that I'm not ready to, other than just quoting the prophecy. Okay. Um, and and uh, um, there's so many things that I'm, uh, there's so many little threads of, of the fabric of Scripture going through all of these things that I'm trying to stay just on the mechanics. Uh, and to show that there is no indwelling uh, in the Old Testament of the Holy Spirit, and it's temporary, and and that there are some specific purposes uh, that God has in His plan. Um, and Have you come across another word other than being endured? Well, I, I sometimes use bestowed, but uh, I think that's uh, because theme kept saying and 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 endowment or endowment. Yeah. Um, that uh, people picked that up, and and that was when I first heard that uh, I thought uh, he meant some other word, uh, endowment or something, and uh, endowment. So I eventually looked it up. Well, that's a word. That's, that's a real valid word. But why use that word? It's hard to understand. It's not not a common word, um, and and that led to, to to what I'm doing tonight because, well, what what is what, how do they get the Holy Spirit? Okay, so they're endued with it. Well, what does that mean? Dr. Pentecost uses the word endued. Yeah. So he, uh, Thing may have picked it up from, from uh, Dallas Seminary. Uh, I don't know if, if uh, Ellis Chafer used that word or, or not. So, um, uh, but that, that's, that was some of my frustration is here's a word I don't know what it means. It doesn't communicate to me. So here I've got several words where, where it became uh, uh, or it, it, what it came upon, uh, but the idea is it's upon, uh, and the, the thing that sparked my question specifically for this study was when I re saw that it, uh, it clothed Gideon. Uh, I said, oh, well, I can understand that, um, and since I'm not going to be able to get there, here, here's, here's a uh, army suit of the future. It's called an Iron Man suit. But that I'm look. I, I, that's the Holy Spirit on the believer <laughs> in the Old Testament. He's clothed with uh, with his armor. Uh, now uh, that that uh, they call that uh, they nicknamed it uh, the arm the Iron Man suit, but it was really officially called the Tactical Assault Light Operator Suit or Talos. They, I don't know who comes up with all these acronyms, but uh, they've canceled that program because they found. It, that when they were trying to put all this stuff in there that uh, it became a little complicated. And when you try and take a bunch of electronics into uh, the Kishon Valley, if it were, or in the uh, Kishon River, or, uh, uh, that some of that electronics isn't gonna work, uh, especially if you have uh, what they call an EMP, electromagnetic pulse. Well, now, now if he's stuck like this, like uh, the, 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 tin, the tin woodman in the Wizard of Oz, where's my oil? Where's my oil? <laughs> no electricity, it can't move. Any, any enemy within range of that extension cord is in big trouble. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, oh, where was I now? Uh, six. Page six, okay. Uh, so, yeah, there was 1620. So, um, I'll go for a couple more minutes and then we'll, we'll close and, uh, I'll have a bunch for next week, but I'm glad for the questions and uh, especially the one about faith that I hadn't made that point, but that's true. There's no faith involved in, in the, for the most part, except for maybe Alicia, uh, where he asked for the Holy Spirit. And I think there's another, uh, I think there's another, another, uh, there's another guy somewhere. Uh, he's got like one line in the, in the Old Testament. And so it, nobody remembers his name. Um, 
So, um, so we had the spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord anointed me. Okay, yeah, to bring good news to the humble. He has sent me to bind up brokenhearted, to proclaim release to the captives and freedom to prisoners. So there's a special, a special case, and uh, um, there's another another one of these here someplace. But um, uh, on, on Jesus Christ, uh, the Holy Spirit, and uh, I stopped and well, why does it use the Old Testament? Uh, and this one, uh, the, the 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 spirit of, of the Lord God is upon me. Well, why didn't it say it's in Him? I thought, uh, uh, listening to some of the themes, you got the the so-called divine dinosphere that the Holy Spirit's in us, uh, or and that, and that uh, Jesus Christ was the first person to have all that. Um, um, but uh, that was another topic that I that perhaps I can cover somewhere else. But obviously, there's. The, the, the Holy Spirit uh, uh, taking residence up with Jesus Christ is in the prophecy in the Old Testament, as we see here. And then we have rested upon. That's the next uh, uh, topic. Did I, I already had a B? Uh, did I? No, I guess not. Uh, Numbers eleven twenty five. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke to him, and he took away some of the help the Spirit. Oh, and yeah, I, I, well, I talked about this already. Okay, so uh, uh, so you have the word placed or or uh, uh, rested upon, um, and that, now that's not uh, like the New Testament um, um, uh, um, abiding uh, abiding in us. It, that that's this is rested, and and the the idea behind this is being placed upon. Um, and here's another one, same, oh, same passage, Numbers eleven twenty six. But two men had remained in the camp. The name of the one was Eldad, and the name of the other, Medad, and the Spirit rested upon them. And they were among those who had been registered, but had not gone out to the tent. And they prophesied in the camp. So here's one where it's all of a sudden, uh, uh, they're, they're doing whatever they're doing, and all of a sudden they're prophesying. And, and, uh, 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 they may have been a bit surprised by that. Um, and then Moses said uh, a comment on some of this uh, when someone talked about these people. If only all the people were, all the Lord's people were prophets, that the Lord would put his spirit upon them. So here it says that the, the, the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament was not universal. And there's a documentation. Moses saying, I wish it were true. Well, guess what happens in the millennium? His wish comes true. Um, um, it's eight eleven. All right, yeah. Of course. yeah so I think uh, we'll we'll close it up here. Um, I'll just uh, uh, I can write on here. Page seven. Page seven. I put a little line there so I get this for next week. And I got uh, um, uh, here's the points that I was going to make. The summary at the bottom: God sovereignly bestows the Holy Spirit. The endowment number two is uh, endowment of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament is not a permanent indwelling like the New Testament or millennium. In other words, the endowment of the Holy Spirit could be lost. God the Father has a plan that is advanced by the impartation of the Holy Spirit. It is meant to accomplish something. Contrast these points with the one passage on the Holy Spirit in the millennium. Um, so that was kind of an overview, of, uh, and I've got that passage there from Ezekiel. So uh, I guess we'll finish in prayer, and then we'll we'll see if we can post the audio on the on the internet. We've got some technical issues I've got to overcome. Thank you, Father, for today. Thank you for the excitement and, and joy in studying your Word and seeing how you work in the Old Testament and and how you work in 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 our lives in the New Testament. How the the we have advanced over what they had in the in the Old. Testament. Testament, and when we get to the millennium, we'll see it even more advanced. Uh, that your plan is working out uh, as you see fit. And we ask that uh, part of that plan include helping the United States um, stay stay free, uh, that we may have freedom to to study and, and teach your word. We're grateful for Father for for uh, what you've given us.
We thank you in Christ's name. Amen.